John Marquis is the author of a very famous article, often anthologized, entitled Why Abortion is Immoral. Here's Marquis. He's a now retired emeritus professor of philosophy at the University of Kansas. Here's why Marquis's article is so famous. It's not the pro-life argument that you expected. For one thing, it's not at all a religious argument. As far as I know, Marquis is not religious, and and uh, certainly his ethical positions are, are not informed by any kind of religious commitments. You might often expect pro-life people to, to be really driven by religious commitments. Marquis is not. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, Marquis does not claim that the fetus is a person. He doesn't take any position on personhood, and his argument doesn't depend upon the claim that a fetus is a person. His argument depends upon a key claim about what it is that makes killing wrong. And his view is that if a killing deprives the victim of a, of a, of a valuable future like ours, then that killing is seriously wrong. Now, let's back up and start at the beginning. Marquis's final position is going to be this, that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. It's in the same moral category as killing an innocent adult human being. Now, typically, anti-abortion arguments, he says, run like this. They've got certain factual premises, and then they've got certain normative premises, okay? So the factual premises are going to go something like this. These are just examples. Life is present from the moment of conception, I might say. Or fetuses look like babies. Or fetuses possess a characteristic, like a genetic code, that is necessary and sufficient for being a human. Okay, so let's say that we grant one or all of these factual premises. That doesn't yet imply that abortion is wrong. You also have to have a normative premise that says uh, what you ought or ought not to do and that connects somehow with the factual premises. The, the anti-abortion pro-life positions are going to have a very broad normative restriction on killing. For example, they're going to say something like this. It is always, at least prima facie, wrong to take a human life. So that's super broad. It prohibits a ton, like most killings, right? Always wrong to, to take a human life. Well, according to Marquis, the factual premises are plausible, but the, the restriction on killing that is required to get a pro-life argument going is usually implausible about in, in terms of how broad it is. For example, if you say that it's always wrong to take a human life, that's going to even include human cancer cell cultures, which are living in a petri dish. They're living, they're multiplying and dividing, and they're human. They're not mice cells or something like that. Um, but we, we all usually think you can kill human cancer cells. No problem there. It's fine to take that kind of human life. Okay, so so he thinks the typical pro-life restrictions on killing are just too broad to be plausible. Now let's go over to look at pro the typical kinds of pro-choice arguments. Typically, the, um, the pro-choice pro side is going to make this kind of factual claim. Fetuses are not persons. Or fetuses are not rational agents. And then... The pro-choice side is going to have a very narrow normative restriction on killing. It leaves some room to do some killing. It's only going to forbid a narrow range of killings. For example, it is prima facie seriously wrong to kill only persons or only rational agents. And the idea is that, well, since fetuses are not persons or rational agents, it's, it's permissible to kill them. Now, according to Marquis, these restrictions are typically too narrow. Why? Well, if it's that narrow, then that would make it permissible to kill infants or even young children. Why? Because they're not rational agents. They're not thinking through the consequences of their, of their actions yet. And so, therefore, maybe they don't even qualify as persons in the really robust sense of that. 
Or what about the severely retarded or the severely mentally ill? They may not be rational agents, and so they may not count as persons in this strong sense. And therefore, that would make it permissible to kill them. But that can't be right. It can't be permissible to kill infants and young children and so forth. So Marquis finds fault with both the anti-abortion and the pro-choice arguments, specifically when it comes to their normative restrictions on killing. He thinks that's the point where we've got to re-examine the issue. So he wants to ask this question. What is it that makes killing wrong? And let's just start with the case of a normal adult human being. When we think about what it is that makes it wrong to kill an, any adult human being, at least prima facie on the face of it, other things being equal, why is it wrong to kill any adult human being? Well, according to Marquis, what makes it wrong is that we are depriving that human being of their future. And when you deprive some, uh, a victim of their future, you are depriving them of everything, all possible good experiences and benefits that they might ever get. You've taken them from them. All right. So this becomes a key plank in Marquis's argument. It, uh, killing is prima facie wrong if it deprives the victim of a valuable future. Okay. So are you depriving the cancer cells in a Petri dish of a valuable future when you destroy them? No. Uh, are you depriving um, an infant of a valuable future when you kill them? Yes. So this seems to do the work that the other normal restrictions weren't doing well. Now, Marquis finds support from his, for his account of the wrongness of killing in a couple ways. First of all, he thinks that his account explains why killing is one of the worst of crimes. It's because it deprives the victim of maybe more than any other crime. You know, you're not just stealing their house and you're not just taking away um, their health or whatever. You're, you're stealing everything from them, their whole future. And then second, um, his account fits with our, the attitudes of dying people themselves. Dying people themselves often think that they are losing something very valuable. What is it they're losing? They're losing their future, they're losing everything. And so that seems to cohere with what it is that makes killing wrong. You're taking something very valuable from someone, their whole future. Now, here's some of the interesting implications of Marquis's account. It doesn't restrict the wrongness of killing to biological humans. Look, um, depending upon the, the kind of quality of consciousness that different mammals have, they may have very valuable futures too. Say dolphins, they're supposed to be super cognitively advanced. They may have very valuable futures ahead of them where they can really enjoy many of life's pleasure, pleasures in their own uh, dolphin-y way. In that case, if that's true, then it would be seriously wrong to kill dolphins too. And Marquis accepts that. He says, yeah, this, this also may, may make it very wrong to kill other higher mammals. Um, also, Marquis's account means that it might be permissible to, uh, to commit active euthanasia, which is essentially suicide. Um, so his account doesn't entail that active euthanasia is wrong. So for example, if you got someone with a terminal illness or with any, any illness which is going to make their future miserable, and make their future of no value to them. Well, then it's no longer wrong, it seems like, for them to deprive themselves of their future, since it's not a valuable future. This is what he argues. It does, however, entail, like I said before, that it's seriously wrong to kill children and infants. Whether they're rational or not, whether they're even persons or not, you are still depriving them of a very valuable future, which they have in front of them. Okay, so that's the implications of his account. One more important point of clarification. Marquis is not claiming that having a valuable future like ours is a necessary condition of wrongful killing, only that it's a sufficient condition of wrongful killing. Okay, so 
let's say, again, let's go back to a situation where you've got some kind of illness which makes the rest of your life is going to be miserable. It's going to be of no value to you. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's permissible for me to come kill you. Right? I mean, you might think, well, well, you're not depriving someone of a future of value if they don't have a valuable future. But Marco says, yeah, but that's not the only thing that might make a killing wrong. It might also make a killing wrong if it violates the person's own choices, the victim's own desires, regardless of whether or not their life is valuable. If they want to live it, it might be seriously wrong to deprive them of it. Now, if they deprive themselves of it through active euthanasia, that's another thing. But for me to come and deprive them of their future might still be wrong, even if that future is not valuable. Okay. Now, once we're clear about Marquis's account of killing and the wrongness of killing, now we can see his argument against abortion. And it's a super simple one. Premise one, killing is wrong if it deprives the victim of a valuable future. That's what he's already argued. Two, abortion is a killing that deprives the fetus of a valuable future that it would have had. Three, therefore, abortion is prima facie, at least on the face of it, seriously wrong. Okay, a couple points of clarification. First of all, most importantly, note, Marquis is not claiming that the fetus is a person. He doesn't need to claim that. He's not claiming that it's rational or, that, uh, or anything like that. All he's saying is that that fetus, whether you want to call it a person or not, it has a valuable future in front of it. If it comes to term and is born and grows up like the rest of us, it's going to have a future which is just as valuable as the rest of ours, as an ordinary human adult, because it will become an ordinary human adult, um, other things being equal, unless it gets aborted. So it's got a valuable future. No matter what it is now, it's what it's going to be which matters. Okay, so he doesn't have to claim personhood. Secondly... I say in the conclusion that abortion is prima facie seriously wrong. Now, we came to that term. I've used it a couple of times already. Um, we saw that term when we looked at W.D. Ross and prima facie duties. What does it mean? It means on the face of it or other things being equal um, at first glance. So the idea is not that abortion, um, there's no conceivable circumstances in which abortion might be permissible. The idea is that other things being equal, um, you know, if setting aside everything else, abortion is wrong unless there's some other super weighty um, consideration, which we're not thinking about yet. But at least at first sight, abortion is seriously wrong. That, so that's what prima facie means, at first sight. Okay. So that's, the, that's his argument. Super simple. Let's, now he wants to... Um, look at possible objections that you might make to his argument. And he wants to answer those. So here's the first objection, which he says people might make to my argument. They might argue this way. Something cannot be of value unless it is valued by someone. But fetuses can't value their own futures. They're not even thinking yet about themselves or about anything. Therefore, fetuses don't have valuable futures. And if they don't have valuable futures, then it's not wrong for me to deprive the fetus of a valuable future through abortion. Well, here's Marquis's reply. Marquis want, wants to fight with premise one. Premise one is false, he says. Someone's future can be valuable, even if they don't value it themselves, um, if other people can see its value. Or if the person themselves later on in life will see the value of a future that they once did not value. Let me give an example here that he gives. You might take like, you know, a depressed teenager who thinks uh, my life is not worth living right now. And everyone around them maybe can see, uh, oh, oh, it is worth living. Trust me, like you feel real bad right now, but you got a lot of awesome stuff ahead of you. And in fact, that teenager themselves, a week later or a month later or a decade later, it's going to be able to look back and say, yeah, I did have a lot to live for. 
I do. Uh, I, I was just depressed that day. I thought everything looked terrible. I didn't value my own life, my own future, but I do now. Now, if you buy the, the case that the depressed teenager actually does have a valuable future, even though they don't value it, well, then the same can go for the fetus. The fetus may not value their own future while they're a fetus, but they sure will later, and anyone around them could see you've got a valuable future ahead of you. So that's why Marcos projects premise one here. Now, objection two comes from the philosopher Michael Tooley, and here's how it goes. An entity, that's a thing, a thing cannot possess the right to life unless it has the capacity to desire its own continued existence. But fetuses lack this capacity to desire their own continued existence, and therefore fetuses have no right to life. Now, um, Marcus has two replies here. Look, um, you and both of these are rejecting premise one. So, first of all, Marcus says, "Look, look, look. This is not premise one is not true. Imagine that you've got an insurance policy which entitles you to have a medical procedure." that could save your life. Um, and uh, you don't even, you're not even able to conceive of having this procedure done. And therefore you're not even able to conceive of and to desire it because you don't even know it exists, right? Well, you still might have a right to it, even if you can't even conceive of it or desire it, right? So, so premise one is not true. Uh, and then the reply number two is like, look, you've got people who, who might be brainwashed or indoctrinated or drugged or temporarily unconscious who are literally incapable of caring about things which they very well may have a right to or which is valuable to them. They still have a right to it just because they aren't able to uh, think about or understand that right or even desire those things that they have a right to at that time. Okay, so... Um, premise one here is just, just true. Now, the third objection which Marquis anticipates is maybe the most interesting and powerful. And here, it's the objection from contraception. Okay. Now, premise one says contraception deprives someone of a valuable future. How does it do this? Well, it prevents that person from existing. Um, you know, so if you block the egg and the sperm from uniting, you're depriving a person that might have been from having a valuable future. Uh, well, according to Marquis, depriving someone of a valuable future is prima facie seriously wrong. And it would follow as a conclusion that contraception is prima facie seriously morally wrong. Okay, well, how is this an argument against Marquis? Well, because Marquis thinks that obviously contraception is not morally wrong. It's totally fine. And that means that th this is a reductio ad absurdum argument. That is, this is a problem because if his claim, premise two, this is his claim about killing, if that's true, then it leads to an absurd conclusion that contraception is bad, is morally wrong. And that's obviously false. And so the idea is that, well, that means that his premise must be false if it led to this dumb conclusion. Okay, so Marcus agrees that um, contraception is morally permissible, but it looks like his, his claim leads to that false claim, that false conclusion. Now, just to be clear here, um, you know, some pro-life people, most notably the Roman Catholic Church, really does hold that not only is abortion wrong, but contraception is wrong as well. Marquis is not that pro-life guy. He is he does not hold the Roman Catholic position. So he definitely does not want to end up committed to the position that contraception is wrong. So this is a problem for him. How is he going to respond to it? Well, here's his reply. His reply is that, yeah, you're right. The conclusion is false. The conclusion that is that contraception is wrong. But the problem is with P2, the problem is not with my account of killing. The problem was with premise one. What did premise one say? Premise one said that contraception
deprives someone of a valuable future. Marquis wants to say, this is the premise that is not true. It's my premise, which is leading to the bad conclusion. It's premise one. He, so he wants to deny that contraception deprives someone of a valuable future. And how does he argue this? Well, he says, there, in contraception, when you block the sperm and the egg from uniting, there is no someone whose existence, there, there's no someone there who has a valuable future yet. There's no subject of harm. There's no victim. The sperm and the egg are not yet united, and so there is no one thing which has a valuable future. And so that means that contraception, which blocks them from uniting, is not taking away a valuable future that that thing had. There is no thing there yet to have a valuable future. Now you might think, well, wait a minute. Yeah, there is something that has a valuable future. It's the sperm. Well, then Marcus would say, why isn't it the ovum that has the valuable future? It seems like you're discriminating against the ovum. Um, why not? And so you, someone might say, well, it's the ovum that has the valuable future. Well, why pick that instead of the sperm? It seems like either both of them or neither of them uh, have a valuable future. Um, it can't be both the sperm and the ovum individually, though, because that's two things. And th that means there's two futures there. Um, and that means that contraception somehow deprives, takes away two futures that's been, that have been lost. But they don't, there aren't two futures that have been lost. There's one future that has been lost, apparently, this, the existence of this um, you know, future human. But, and then it can't be that the sperm and ovum together already have a future, which has jointly been taken away from them. Um, why? Why don't they have a, a combined future yet? Because they're not together yet. Okay, so nothing here has a future which has been taken away. Not the sperm, not the ovum, not both of them individually. That would mean two futures and not both of them together because they're not together yet. There is no future that has been taken away. So contraception does not deprive anyone of a valuable future or anything of a valuable future, and therefore it's not morally wrong. That's his idea. Okay, now, uh, there's a lot to think about with Marquis's account of killing. Let me just leave you with, with three questions. And these all focus on his, uh, yeah, his account of the wrongness of killing. Um, first of all, I'm wondering whether intentions play any role in his account of the wrongness of killing. So what if I intend to save somebody's life, but I accidentally kill them? I still deprive them of a future of value. Does that mean that what I've done is seriously wrong? That's an interesting thought. Um, is there any difference between manslaughter and first-degree murder, in other words, on Marquis's own? We might usually think that the difference is intentions. One is an unintentional killing, and one is intentional. But... I'm not sure why there would be that difference on Marquis's view if all that counts is whether you could deprive someone of the of a future of value. You've done the same thing on in both cases on his view. I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe he's got a good answer to that. And then secondly, what does Marquis's view mean for the morality of killing, say, in self-defense? Okay, so let's say that you're being attacked. The only way to save your own life is to kill your attacker. Either they're going to deprive you of a, your valuable future, or you're going to deprive them of their valuable future. What is it that makes a, an act of killing in self-defense somehow morally better than than that? You know, a killing that's just gratuitous. Both of them have the same effect: of depriving someone of a, a valuable future. You can ask the same questions about killing in war or killing as a punishment for crime. And then finally, let's say that I grant for the sake of argument that abortion or similar killings um, that are doing someone of a future of value are prima facie wrong. That is, at first sight, they look like these are wrong. Let's say I grant that. Could there still be other factors that outweigh the prima facie wrongness? 
and that make it overall permissible? So you might say, well, yeah, abortion is prima facie wrong because it deprives some of the future value. But it's prima facie even worse to, say, restrict the mother's freedom. And so that means it is permissible in certain case, in these cases to overall to, to have an abortion. Or you might say, well, prima facie, it's, having an abortion is wrong. But there's this much weightier factor, um, which has to do with, you know, cases of rape or the life of the mother being at stake. And those outweigh the wrongness of, of abortion. But it might be other factors, too. Maybe it's just restricting the mother's freedom. I don't know. The point is, what are there other factors that might outweigh the prima facie wrongness of a killing, specifically of abortion? Think about that.